Good morning, everyone. You all were chatting. You all were chatting louder than that before. So come on. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> uh, welcome to a Sunday morning worship. Um, it is March the twenty seventh, twenty twenty two. Uh, and for those of you uh, joining us online, welcome as well. Um, and I hope that I've got our sound and everything correct. Um, I've been accused of not doing it right before. So for your sake, I hope we have. Um, and I'll ask the IT folks in the back to wave their hands or something if I do something wrong. To begin our service this morning, we will begin with a call of worship. Our call of worship will be sung. Uh, followed by a gathering hymns. And I'll ask you to stand with us, please, as we sing our call to worship number 1040. Come, now is the time to worship.
Once again, for those of you who may not have been here, welcome to our Sunday morning service, uh, Sunday, March 27th, 2022. Um, a good welcome to Reverend Donovan Myers. Good to have you with us, sir, and glad to see you recovered. Reverend Chris used to say to me, Bud, my dad always taught me to walk with a sermon in my pocket. And when I was doing my program, I said, no, I won't even say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, good to have you with us, sir. Um, a couple of announcements. Um, I'll wait in a couple of minutes. Jewel that are the overhead folks will put the birthdays up. But um, our, our service of Lincoln D. Lincoln that was supposed to take place last week had to be postponed on the, um, it is rescheduled for next Sunday, April the 3rd at 4 p.m. at the John Gray United Church in West Bay. Next week, Sunday, April the 3rd, 4 p.m., John Gray United in West Bay. I got it right? And you're not going to catch COVID again. No. Promise. Good. <laughs> um, a couple other things. We've relaxed to somewhat our seating arrangements. And we're simply asking that uh, if you're not, don't live in the same household to just allow one seat between you and the people next to you uh, and to sanitize your hands and wear masks as you come in. So we're getting back to some better level of normality. One of these days, maybe we'll even get rid of masks, who knows? Um, and uh, just a note here for those of you mostly watching online that they're continuing to evaluate how and when we can get our Sunday school children back in the church in person. And I know there's a concerted effort to get that done because we do understand the challenges that that um, the places on, on, on people. Um, Bible study will continue. Um, and I noticed um, we're doing the next three weeks, we'd, last week we read the different gospel accounts of the triumphal entry. Um, Wednesday coming the 30th, we'll read the accounts of the trial. April the 6th, the accounts of the crucifixion. And April the 13th, the accounts of the resurrection. And I noticed when Reverend Donovan distributed his uh, account as preaching wrote on Friday, he's going to be following not quite the same, but a similar pattern. And for those of you who went through the, who struggled through Isaiah with us, um, he's got a couple of references to the Old Testament, which you might find interesting. But for any of you who would want to join in, feel free to join in without even um, turning on your camera and just listen. Um, so it's Wednesday evenings at seven o'clock via Zoom. Um, before we put our we got some birthdays, I think, do we? Uh, I'd like to also say a welcome to Miguel, Gail, and Andrew. Good to have you with us. Um, birthdays. Victoria Brock, Jacob Watler on the 28th, that's tomorrow, and Alison Turner on the 1st. Anyone else with a birthday this coming week? I see Donna whispering to Bruce is that trying to tell him he should tell us his birthday. <laughs> Anyone else with a birthday this week that we don't have on our list? All right. Um, any anniversaries? Clive and Sharon Hines. What's that, Clive? 50? <laughs> I know you. <laughs> It's good to remind you every time we remind you so you get it right because you don't want to get that date wrong, Clive. Um, so let's have a happy birthday. And anyone else with an anniversary? All right. Um, but let's have a round of happy birthday and then happy anniversary.
There, the four seats right across here. At this time, I'll invite Miss Valerie up to present our children's time. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Did you know that some very young people think they know God's name? They think he's called Harold. And some of them even think he likes tennis. And some of them are waiting to find out what gravy bread is. And do you know why? Because all these children have learned to say the Lord's Prayer, but they've only learned it by listening to it. And so they haven't always been able to pick up the right words or understand it. So, our Father who art in heaven, Harold be thy name. You can understand it. Give us this day our gravy bread, sensible, thy Wimbledon, <laughs> yeah, you see, we learn the prayer, and unfortunately, some of us get into the habit of saying it a bit like our times tables, we just say it because we've learned it by rote and we're not really thinking about what it means. And that really wasn't what Jesus wanted. He did teach it to the disciples, and we do say it like that, but he also gave it to them because he wanted them to understand the different parts of it. And then they could take that pattern, a bit like a recipe, and they could put their own words into it. So let's very quickly just go through what all the different sections are. Our Father who art in heaven. Well, isn't it great? He's God, and we can call him Father because we are his children. And he lives in heaven because we don't pray to things that are on earth. And he's our Father because we're praying for all of us. Hallowed be thy name. Well, that's just us saying your name is very holy, and we respect that. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Well, that's Jesus telling them God is in control and we're promising to do our very best to make sure things on earth are done the same way as they are in heaven. They're done how God wants them to be done. Give us this day our daily bread. Well, it wasn't just the manna that came from heaven. It's that we look to God to meet all our needs today, tomorrow, every single day. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Well, that's asking for us to have our sins forgiven, but we have to make sure we've forgiven other people before we even ask that. Lead us not into temptation. Well, that's just saying, can you help us to avoid making bad decisions um, or making the wrong choices? but deliver us from evil. Well, it's not pizza coming by taxi or delivery man. It is us asking God to rescue us from our sins and to keep evil out of our lives. And then at the end, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. That's us saying, we remember that everything belongs to him. He is in control of heaven and earth. He has all the power and he deserves our praise always. Now, can we do that in our own words? Mm, it's a big ask, isn't it? But sometimes, you know, using your fingers helps. So we can see. All right, let's see. So we're going to start off and we're going to say, okay, the beginning of that prayer, we were praising God. And then we have to thank him for everything that we have. Then we say sorry for all the things that we have done wrong. Then 
we tell them who and what we want to pray for. And then we ask him to help us. So we can make the prayer our own. Sometimes difficult even to think, and it's very easy to fall into the trap whenever you say, who are you going to pray for? But here's a way you might help to remember it. Let's use our five fingers. We're going to use our two thumbs that are closest to us when we fold our hands to pray. So we're going to remember our family and our friends. They'll be the first one. Then it will be our teachers and our helpers, the next sort of circle. Then it will be the leaders, the important people in our country or around the world. Then on our ring fingers, we are going to remember the people that need help, whether they're sick, or they're struggling for food, or they're escaping from a war. And right at the end, on little pinky, we remember ourselves. But we don't want to just do our prayer, like I said before, like a parrot. Dear God, I'm praying for my family and my friends, my teacher and my helper. He wants us to, it to come from our heart. So if you're paying, praying for your granny, then... Ask God to mind her sore knees, or if you're pay, praying for your friends, you can pray that they don't argue with you so much. You make it very personal. Now, to remember all that, it's hard. You know, when adults do it, they, they keep a prayer diary. They write it all down, and you might not be able to do that. But you might want to keep a photograph or a picture or even have a prayer box where you have little things that will help you to remember what you want to pray for. And that's a kind of a long organized prayer. So that's probably one that you're best doing maybe in your bedroom when it's nice and quiet, where you can close your eyes, fold your hands, bow your head and take your time. But, you know, there's lots of other ways to pray as well. God likes us to talk to him all the time and he doesn't matter how long or how short it is and he doesn't care if you use the right or the important words you just talk to him as you would talk to anybody so we can pray about anything we can pray when we're mad we can pray when we're glad we can pray when we're sad we can play, pray when we're scared we can pray standing up we can pray sitting down we can pray kneeling we can pray walking and anywhere. I mean, let's face it. Daniel prayed when he was in the lion's den. Peter prayed when he was in a boat and underwater. Jonah prayed when he was in the belly of a big fish. And our prayers can be short. Do you say grace before you eat your meal? It's only a sentence. Close your eyes and give thanks. Or maybe you have a nice short prayer that you say every night before you get into bed. My class have one of those to have a look at. We can just do one-liners through the day. Maybe when you're going in to do something or something stressing you, you just for a moment close your eyes or take a minute and say, Lord, be with me. Or something nice happens and you can say, thank you, God, for that. God hears us and he will answer. But he answers because he knows what is best for us. Maybe not what we're asking for. So we need to remember that it's God's will. Sometimes the answer is no or stop. You might think he hasn't answered. Sometimes it's wait, and sometimes you get the green light, and it's go. And so at the end of all that, God knows what we need, but he wants us to ask him. He wants us to invite him to get involved. He wants to hear from us and to answer our prayers. He wants to spend us to spend time with him. He wants us to listen to him. He wants us to obey him. He wants a relationship with us. He wants to hold on to us, but he wants us to hold on to him. 
He wants our prayers to come from our heart. So we pray. But perhaps one of the other most important reasons to pray is that Jesus prayed. He prayed a lot in his lifetime and even right up to the end. And if he prays to God, then we certainly should. And what's more, although it's for another day, he prayed for us, all of us, you and me. So I hope that this week you will maybe give some thought, take some time to how you pray to God. And now let us pray. Dear God, we want to take a minute not to ask for anything, but simply to say thank you for all that we have. Amen. Thank you, Miss Valerie. That was very appropriate. Um, let us have a song of praise. Let us stand as we sing number four, four, five. Shine, Jesus, shine.
Please be seated. Now, one of the hardest things to do is to trust God. Me and Valerie had no communication. And as we go to the Lord in prayer, I'm going to take us through a Philip Yancey prayer that I clearly enjoy and find it meaningful. Philip Yancey says that in the Bible, there are about 650 prayers. Short, long, reflecting different circumstances and moods. He says, consider the Lord's prayer. Jesus taught it to his disciples as a model prayer. And like most church goers, we recite it every Sunday without having a second thought about it. He said we should slow down, let it sink in, and think about the words. I'd ask you to bow your heads as I lead you in prayer and let the words as I carry them through guide you in your own personal prayer, even though it's a corporate prayer for today. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, remind us today that you live and reign not only in heaven, but all around us in each of our lives. Make us aware of your active presence all day in all our undertakings and in the people that we meet. Hallowed be your name. How can we recognize you in the splendor of nature, in the odd mix of people we meet, in the still voice that calls each of us to be more like you? May we hallow whatever lies before us by conscience, consciously referring it to you. And may we also honor your perfection and holiness by seeking to become more like you. Your kingdom come, Lord. Yes, and allow us to each be an agent of that kingdom by bringing peace to the anxious, grace to the needy, and your love to all whom we touch. May people believe in your reign of goodness because of how we live our lives today. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we see that will most clearly in Jesus, who healed the sick and comforted the grieving, who lifted up the downtrodden, who stood always for life and not death, for hope and not despair, for freedom and not bondage. Jesus lived out your will on earth. Help us to be more like him. Give us this day our daily bread. We have no guarantee of a day beyond this one. May we trust you for what we need today, nourishment for the body and soul, and not to worry about the future needs. May we... Forgive, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lord, remind us of our true state as debtors who can never buy our way into your favor. Thank God we do not have to. Grant us the same attitude of forgiving grace towards those who owe us and who have wronged us that you have shown towards us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
Lord, let us not slide mindlessly towards evil today. Rather, make us alert to its temptation and make us strong to resist it with neither fear nor regret. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Words of assurance of forgiveness as we approach each Easter time, none more appropriate than John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting light. This is the word of the Lord. I will, we're going to have a mission moment now, and I will invite Sarah and Juliet to coordinate that for us. Good morning, everyone. Just as a reminder, we normally have a mission moment the last Sunday of every month. Um, and today we're going to feature, I have a PowerPoint, but I'll wait to see if it comes up. Um, today, I'm just going to be talking about the war that's going on in the world right now. I'm sure we've all read, watched videos, followed on social media, and we all have our own um, feelings. and um, know what's happening there. So I just wanted to talk about hope and also in ways that we can help. Um, I will show you a few photos, but just wanted to say the United Church and Reverend Myers can correct me if I'm wrong here. The United Church's response to this is they have met with the Red Cross in Cayman Islands and we are going to be collecting um, donations. So if you would like to donate something, just put it in an envelope at the back that says Ukraine it's going to be um, open until the end of May. So you can do so from now until the end of May. And the Cayman Islands Red Cross is going to give it to the, or get it over to the Red Cross in Ukraine. And I believe one of the reasons why they've chosen one of the bigger organizations, it's because um, in a time like this, uh, a bigger organization is better mobilized to get help. Um, to people where they need it because they have more infrastructure and more connections. So that would be the church's response. But what I would like to um, share with you is um, mission is not just about, you know, sending, which is an important part. It's not just about sending help to people. It's also about spreading the word of God. And um, I don't know, well, many of us remember Sheila Purdom. She shared with me, and she has been sharing with me these links about a British organization that has a radio, a Christian radio station in Ukraine, and they are still operating their radio station, and they send a weekly, sorry, a daily update from the various broadcasters. So, Stephanie, if you go to the next slide, that's the team. Their radio station is called FIBA, and they're, the team that sits there, they're comprised of counselors and various broadcasters. If you go to the next one. Um, this was one of the updates um, that came from one of the broadcasters and I'll just read it for you. There's a bit more detail than what's over there. Our broadcasters talk with listeners and listen to them. They encourage them, pray for them and read scriptures aloud. This has been particularly effective and impactful recently. People are responding to God's word in a new way, especially the Psalms which have been speaking directly to Ukrainians in this situation. People are calling the station, having heard the Bible being read, not knowing anything about Christianity, but wanting to understand what it is and what they are feeling and how to be part of it. So it is a small ray of hope amongst all the other things that's going on. It's very encouraging um, to read their update every day. It's a very small update, and sometimes they post a, a video of what's happening. Go to the next one. Um, if you would like to um, follow their updates, there's a website there, um, www.fever.org, um, or you can always ask me and I can send email the link to you. And the last one, um, that's just a photo of the 
Red Cross in Ukraine getting supplies into a, um, a city that was recently damaged. Again, I just wanted to remind us that the United Church in Cayman is going to support the Red Cross in Ukraine through Cayman Islands Red Cross. And they have, sometimes it's hard to get information and I know we're always struggling to know what's right from what's wrong and what's true versus what's not true. And the, I'm not on social media, so I could only get one photo before it blocked me. The Ukrainian um, Red Cross has a Twitter account and they post updates every day on which area they're helping and what they're doing. So you can also follow there to see what, um, what the latest updates are. And lastly, as Bud just reminded us, none of us coordinated anything of what we would be saying. I didn't know what Valerie was going to do for her children's time. I didn't know what Bud was going to do for his prayer. Um, I know I often feel this. It's hard for me to connect what's going on on the other side of the world because it's so different. It's not anything I've ever seen um, in my lifetime. And sometimes you just look at those things and you feel helpless because you go, well, what can I do? And we all should remember that one of the most powerful things that we have in our tool belt is prayer. And that even when we feel, um, you know, we can't do anything or helpless, there is that very um, strong tool. So I know we've been praying in our intercessory prayers for Ukraine and we will continue to do so, but I will encourage you um, to do so in your own, own time at home. Uh, so that's our mission moment for today. And if you have any questions or you want to get any more information about what I've um, discussed, you can see me after or just send me an email. Thank you. The scripture reading today is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 to 21. And Donna will read for us. Today's reading comes from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5, verses 16 to 21. 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, verses 16 to 21. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Ms. Donna. Let us remain seated. Uh, Reverend uh, Meyer's topic today is rooted and reconciled. Let us remain seated as we sing our song of preparation, they that wait upon the Lord, and then Reverend Myers will speak to us.
Gracious God, we come waiting on you. Waiting on you to hear a word that speaks to our moment, that calms our fears, that challenges our unwillingness to be engaged, that invites us into a relationship with Christ. We come waiting for that word. Speak now in the stillness while we wait on the hushed our hearts to listen in expectancy. Speak, O oh blessed master, in this quiet hour. May we see your face, Lord, and feel your touch of power. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Reverend Otto, thank you so much, sir, for standing in the gap two Sundays in a row. I almost felt like using up another of my um, moments to ask God for forgiveness and to tell you that I really couldn't come this morning again. But no, I really enjoyed your, enjoyed your, your messages as I participated by uh, joining in online over the last two weeks. And thank you all for your prayers. This morning, our reading is a reading about being a new creation, about the state of being that we have, the state of being that the Christian takes on because of the work of reconciliation that God does in our lives through Jesus Christ. When we think of reconciliation, <clears throat> many of us, uh, our minds go to political, legal, or economic activities. Uh, whether if you're a business owner and you have an impasse with workers and you're trying to figure out um, some issues around wages or, or um, workplace um, conditions or so on, reconciling the difference between the two. Or maybe in the conversations that have, have happened between the various groups in post-apartheid South Africa, when you know those who were responsible for um, bringing the, um, or acting unjustly towards others, uh, came together and had conversations in this Truth and Reconciliation Commission, trying to bring things together. Or maybe in your own checkbook, if you'd use those anymore, you reconcile them. You kind of figure out, you know, uh, what you've uh, put out and put in, or maybe use an app for that now, eh? just kind of make sure that you are are keeping up to date on how your, your, your spending is going and how it connects with what you do have in the bank so that the next time you swipe the card, you're not in a problem, or maybe for you, that's never a problem. But for some of us, we do have to reconcile that. Eh? Uh, <laughs> but what does Paul mean about reconciliation when he talks about reconciliation? He's talking about putting things in right order. It's about restoring balance. It is about bringing together those things that were once separated, that are not tied together, not meshing, not, not sinking. And so he talks about being reconciled. And he speaks pr pr primarily about the fact that God restores relationship with human beings broken because of sin through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Let me just reassert just two of the points that Paul makes in this text to us. One of them is that God it is who is responsible for reconciling or connecting. It is God's work. We are reconnected, restored in relationship with God because of Jesus' sacrifice. Verse 18 says, all this is from God. The one who reconciled us to himself through Christ. Very clearly, it is God's doing. Sometimes we want to take on uh, the thing to think that it is because we thought was a great idea to come close to God while we and God are in a relationship. The truth is that it is God who first calls us. It is God who woos us. It is God who comes seeking after us. And it is that which brings us into relationship with God. All relationships, all covenants that God has made with people start with God. It is God who sets out to do so. That is because God loves, for God so loved that God gave 
It is God who initiates. And so we remain conscious that there are old things that can creep back into our lives and can pop up from time to time to prevent us from enjoying the reconciled relationship that we share with God. And being mindful of those, we trust Christ every day to help to maintain that connection. But it is God who does the connecting. This is a, a great place for you to say, praise the Lord. Thank God that God found me. If you were a part of a church that, that did testimonies or maybe of a real country church where people would tell us about, you know, that God has snatched you as a branch from the burning. That kind of imagery of God saving us out of a path that leads to an unfulfilled life and also leads to eternal our, our separation from God. He says, God is the one who initiates that activity and brings us back. But the second thing I assert from what Paul says in this passage is that not only then is it God who reconciles or reconnects or is the one who initiates, but we are then to get on board with God's ministry of reconciliation. So God has started and God says, hey, you need to get with the program. You need to participate in this ministry. And there seems to be a process in what Paul is outlining that we first must be reconciled with, to God. Then we must actively reconcile with those with whom we have fractious relationships. Ouch. Not sleeping at this point, eh? With me? Um, we must and I'm using the word must very purposely and strongly there, we must reconcile with those persons that we have fractious relationships. And you get one Sunday to go off into your own head space and not listen to the rest of the sermon. If only you start to think about that one relationship that you need to fix. And it leaves you at the end of uh, us here saying, come on, Brad, let's get it all done quickly because I need to go and settle with someone outside. So we must be re reconciled to God. Then we must reconcile with others. And then we must engage a ministry of helping other people to reconcile. Whether it is reconciling their own broken relationships but first and foremost to reconcile their relationship with God. So we must experience reconciliation that God works in our lives. It is personal. It is something that we experience for ourselves. But then we must practice reconciliation. How can we become teachers of a lesson that we are not willing to embody ourselves? So before we can go out and tell other people, hey, you guys, you need to get together. You need to figure out where do I need to get it together? And then we must lead others into reconciliation, working as evangelists. That's one of the things that I find very interesting about what Paul says um, when, he, when he tells people about the work of evangelism. He says, you must do the work of evangelism. Although he says in other par parts of the um, New Testament, uh, in other texts, that there are some people who have a gift of evangelism. So some people who are just naturally able to, uh, by, by the giftings that God has given them, just to speak to people about Christ and lead them to Christ, and they come. But the rest of us, who might not have that natural or that supernatural ability, we have a work to do of reconciliation, of being evangelists, of bringing G people and Jesus together. Just as how the disciple uh, went and called his brother, and connected him with Jesus. So too we are to call people and connect them with Christ. So the, the work of reconciliation is that work of evangelism, but it's the work of justice that we can't pretend to not have any interest in or any time for. We can't be passive bystanders. We must be involved in it, not saying, that, hey, that's not my jib, it's not my business, I'm not gonna get involved, but it's the work of reconciling, bringing together God's people, God's creation, leading into reconciliation. So God is the one who reconciles us. We must get on board with the ministry of reconciliation. Now, when we engage the process, then according to verse 21 of the text that was just read for us, it says, in him, we become the righteousness of God. 
In other words, we become what God does. Or we become what God is doing to bring about righteousness and justice in the world. We are reconciled. And if we are practicing reconciliation and leading others into that, then that becomes part and parcel of who we are. So in order to experience God drawing near and to engage with those who are estranged, and then to educate others and in the art of reconciling their own splintered relationships, verse 16 gives us some very sage advice. It says from now on, do not look at anyone the, world, the way the world does. Instead, it seems as if Paul is encouraging us to see others instead through the eyes of Christ, through the eyes of compassion, through the eyes of forgiveness, through the eyes of love. And that willingness to see other people differently means that those things that were important before we knew Christ, before we experienced the reconciliation to God, those things that were part of how we lived as part of the old flesh or worldly way are no longer of importance to us. So for example, Galatians 6 and verse 15, Paul says that following Christ's death, neither circumcision or uncircumcision means anything anymore. The things that were preoccupying people and trying to distinguish who belonged and who was part of and who wasn't a part of. He says, those things aren't important anymore. What really counts is that the new creation has come. So the old or worldly or fleshly eye will focus on things like ethnicity and status and gender. But here's what Paul says in Galatians 3 and verse 28. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's not any slave or free person. There's no male or free, female. He says, that is all because you are now one in Christ. The things that separate our or, or distinctions or distinguishing things are the things that we no longer harp on, but instead we look at those things that connect us. The fact that we are one in Christ. So the old or world, your flesh, the eyes, will focus on things that separate us from one another. Those elements of the flesh bring about conflict and create disputes. Just as nothing will separate us from the love of God, so too nothing should separate us from each other. But we must admit that there are walls that we construct, the walls that we build to separate ourselves that alienate others. And those walls that we use to separate and alienate are walls that are informed by perspectives of seeing ourselves through what Paul says are worldly or fleshly eyes. But now we have the eyes of the spirit. That's what being reconciled to God means, that we now are seeing things from a different point of view. So the walls of fear and rejection and prejudice and untruth, of pretense, of hypocrisy, of political leanings, of religious differences are all the walls that we must now recognize are no longer the ways, the things that should divide us. The walls that are inspired by our desire to preserve our privilege. Now we stop there a moment to maintain our status or maybe even to secure our wealth those walls that we create in order to ensure that we secure our own future, not mindful of anybody else's. Those are the walls that must be torn down. The walls that are built up to keep out strangers. Or what about strange people? Those who are different, those who don't look like sound like, behave like, don't conform to our ideas of belonging to our group. Those walls must be torn down. Remember I did say that you had permission to not be listening to me? Here's another place where you can take your little tangent. Are there those walls that you know of in your own relationships with others that might need to be torn down? those places of reconciliation that need to happen around how you have been in relationship with other people. Because the truth is what Paul is saying that we can't sit here being 
confident of our reconciliation to God. We are right with God and, and ready for heaven and secure for the journey to our final resting place and be disconnected. Be, how can we be brothers or sisters and can't even relate with each other? It's just one of those things that does, does not match up, doesn't reconcile, doesn't balance. So as I close this morning, I want to ask you, where are you in the reconciliation process? Have you settled your account with God? And this is where I go back to my old roots of good old country preachers who ask you if your account with God has been settled. Whether or not your relationship with God has been synced. Has God taken your sin and you receive God's righteousness. That's a transaction that each of us must experience to enter the journey of faith. For some of us, we have a date, a time, a moment that we can point to and say, I remember that moment I became so clear. For others, it has become kind of like a rolling thing along of a path of our life or a period in our, in our, in our experience. But for all of us, we have to answer the question, is my relationship with God secure? Now, it doesn't mean that your relationship with God doesn't need work. In fact, it does mean that having been reconciled with God, there is an ongoing nurturing of that relationship. Not because God steps away, but because we're so easy to pull our hands out of his. But are you reconciled to God? I am mindful that being a good person, a good church attender, a good member even, does not necessarily answer that question. So my question to you is, are you in relationship with God through Jesus Christ? So that's the first part. And I trust that most of us in here can say, yeah, thank God. I've responded to God's call. My relationship with Christ is secure. But what about the relationships that you have that need mending? What about those relationships? How active, how proactive, how intentional are you in working at mending severed relationships? I know that many things cause us to be in contentious or fractured or broken relationships. And some of those things are things that are of our own doing. And many times it is something of somebody else's doing. But none of those things absolve us from working at those relationships. In fact, Jesus was very clear when he says, if you come to the altar to offer your gift, and you remember that there is someone who has something against you. Not that you have something against them, because you're fine. I don't know what's her problem. And I don't want to beef with him. But he says, in that situation, when you have no fault, you are the purely free and, and, and guiltless person. He says, in that situation, leave the altar. Go back. Find the person resolve the relationship, then come back. That's a big responsibility. That's a big ask. But that's what he asks. It tells us a little bit about how important he sees us mending relationships. So how are you working at mending your relationships? And then the last question is, are you stepping out to become an ambassador? Because that's what it tells us in the text. It says, we are now called to be ambassadors of Christ, of God's reconciliation. Are we ambassadors in the ministry of reconciliation? So are you bringing others to Christ? Can I challenge us over the rest of this year? That there might be someone within the sphere of our influence, of our, of our families, of our colleagues, of our lives, 
someone who we could really invite to Christ. Now, you notice I didn't say invite to church. Church might be an outworking of inviting them to Christ, and, and that's wonderful. Please invite them to church, but invite them to Christ. Share with them your own experience of coming to know God as your Savior and asking them to see Christ as well for themselves. So the work of evangelism, but then are you an ambassador for the work of justice, of bringing together fractious situations? You sit in your nice corner office, but outside in the cubicles, just in front of your nice glass door, are two people who cannot be with each other. You know something? As long as you keep it out there, don't bring it in here, I'm fine. No? Can you become a, an ambassador for God's reconciliation? An ambassador of a reconciliation sometimes in the hardest places in our families between two warring siblings or relatives or something like that, but an ambassador of relationship. So where are you in the process of reconciliation? Well, I hope you are doing a little better than the two boys, two brothers who went to their rabbi because they were having a long standing feud. So they decided to go to him to settle it. And the rabbi got them to reconcile their difference and to shake hands on it. And just when they were about to go through the door, the rabbi thought, you know, guys, before you leave, I'd like for each one of you to make a wish for the other in honor of the Jewish New Year. So the first brother turns to the second one and he says to him, I wish for you what you wish for me. And at that, the second brother threw up his hand and said, Rabbi, see there? The boy's starting up again. Be reconciled to God. Be reconciled with each other. Be reconciled or be ambassadors of reconciliation among those in the world. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. As we go to God in prayer, I invite us to spend one moment in reflection. Maybe it is a prayer asking God to come into your own heart and to offer you his cleansing and forgiveness and to reconcile you to him. Or maybe it's a prayer asking God to help you as you go to reconcile a relationship that is broken. Or maybe it's a prayer asking God for help that you'll have the boldness to share the gospel with others and bring others together and to Christ. Gracious God, we come from different places with different needs but we come to you who in no way turns us aside. We're grateful to you because of Christ's work on the cross, we can receive forgiveness of our sins. And we pray for those this morning who pray today, asking you to restore relationships between themselves and you, that you would strengthen them and nurture them and help us to lovingly embrace and encourage them too. And we pray, Lord, for the many relationships that are splintered, that have errors that require some amount of work to get them back on track, that you give us the grace to tend to those relationships. We pray, Lord, for boldness, for the ability to stand up and to not be ashamed of the gospel, but to declare it with love and grace to those who we know and for whom we would want to share also the salvation we have received from Christ. Lord, help us to also be people who work for justice in our world, in the places where there is hate and, and walls that divide. And we come this morning just asking that in all of these prayers, 
our desire is that you might be glorified in our lives. We lift up the challenges of our world as we have been hearing and thinking and, and feeling. We see the, the injustice of man's inhumanity to mankind. We pray that you would bring about an end to it, that where there are wars and conflicts, that your love might be the salve, the antidote that brings about peace. Help us to not only pray for, but to act in ways that bring about peace in all our world. And we pray for those who are in need, those who are hungry, homeless, those who feel helpless, those who are hurting. We pray, God, that you'll come near to them and in your love, embrace and restore and lift up. And so, God, we pray that as we go into this week, we might go with the assurance that the God who calls us into relationship with himself is a God who walks with us each day. We pray, too, that you will bless the gifts that we will bring to you this morning in our offerings, whether they come in the basket or come online. We ask that you would use them as you bless them for the proclamation of the good news to all people throughout the world. We pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Donovan. Our going forth hymn is number 857. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry. Number 587.
Go now in peace to serve the Lord, and may the blessings of God, our Father, of Christ, our Savior, and of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, be with you today and every day. large size. 